That's what's scary. The man's been in there for almost four years, and he doesn't see the urgency that many of us in this room see about our books and about our finances. It's really incomprehensible to us as candidates that he would leave the town in this potential shape without verified books. How, how do you, nothing is valid. The numbers don't make any sense. They're all fantasy without audited books. And he's had four years to try and audit the books. He, he's been in uh, for almost four years. Let's give him a pass, although I won't, for 2012. He's been in for 13 and 14. Why not certify those books that he's been directly responsible for? I don't know the answer to that. When we try and ask him about uh, those questions at board meetings, question and answer period has been eliminated. We can't do that. <laughs> Next question. What is your opinion of the current town workforce? <laughs> They're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I say that. Led by Jimmy Walsh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever round of applause for Jimmy Walsh. Yeah. 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 Ricky does all the work, but we'll give Jimmy the applause. So. <laughs> okay, here's, here's the thing. One of the things, we did our palm cards, you know, and this is new to me. You have your picture and you have all these bullets of what you're going to do. And one of the things that I insisted being on, on my palm card was a, a section called Taking the Politics Out of Town Hall. And it includes things like hiring by merit, not patronage or nepotism, uh, no more insider deals in the back room, uh, no more political appointments to town boards. But one that really mattered to me is no more politics in the treatment of town employees. These guys are a political force. kicked around and when the political winds shift, they have to start looking over a different shoulder, but they're always looking over one shoulder. They have to be put in a position to succeed. And I will tell you this, if you want to know the bottom line on both our police department and our department of public works, count the disasters that have happened in this town. Zero. The, the roads get plowed, the roads, the, the snow gets plowed, the roads get paved. Uh, we're kept safe, and I have no idea how that happens. <laughs> because DPW is down, employees, politics. You know, the, the majority that took over last time was different from the majority of the DPW workers, because our town employees, unfortunately, have like, you know how you see in the paper that uh, Hillary Clinton, parentheses, D, or she's a Democrat. Our town employees have the same thing. They have their name, and then they have a letter after them. And they're treated politically. They're mistreated politically. Um, they do a great job. Most of them, I'm not going to pretend, I'm not going to pander and say that everybody does a good job. And I said this in another meeting that uh, one of my goals will be to find the dead wood and, and get rid of it because we pay too much in taxes to carry that. But these guys are our heroes in this town. And they are in that weird kind of job where if they do everything right, they won't hear a sound. But if they make a single mistake, the roar will be deaf. And if you've ever been in a job where that's the truth, uh, you know that you have to appreciate these guys. And uh, so that's my position on town employees. I would look, very much look forward to working with them. Jack, I have a follow-up, a different question, but it fits in with um, this question. It says, I've heard you plan on cutting back the police force. I've that too. No, it's not true. No, it's, it's ridiculous. So far, this is what I'm doing. I'm laying off 10 cops, I'm laying off five DPW guys, and I'm eliminating the parks and recreation department. Now, I really wish like even one of those thoughts had come out of my mouth. Here's my position. I've said this before. I do not believe in layoffs. In a town this size, local government is an important local employer. If a person is doing their job, every single day and they're feeding their family and they're keeping a roof over their children's heads. They never, in, if I'm supervisor, would I ever lay off a single person. Now having said that, what I've also said, and this is what gets misconstrued, is that if somebody retires or somebody resigns, the department head is going to have to make a case that that position is essential or they may not be replaced. Um, so, and I, what I also said, and I've said, I, I implied it before, is um, I supervise staff in a civil service environment. I'm not going to accept non-performance. 
because the guys at DPW and the police department who are doing their jobs are the ones who are paying every day for the guys who aren't doing their jobs. I think the vast majority of both the police department and DPW are great and they're doing their job. I do not believe in layoffs, but I also don't believe that, that town government is a jobs program. I don't think you keep people who aren't, who aren't cutting, but we, we have no, we have such a low crime rate in this town. We're walking around doing petitions. You walk in somebody's driveway, the garage door's open. Okay, the front, the, the only the screen door is closed in the front, and you can't find the people. I was born in the Bronx. I, there was one night I, I thought I should just rip off a house just on principle. <laughs> how, how do people live like this? And the reason is, is because our police job does, our police department does a great job. I have no designs on laying off anybody. Uh, and if anybody in this room, uh, I live at 232 Hudson Avenue in Hampton Manor. If you ever hear any of this crap about what I'm going to do, come over to my house and I will spend as long as it takes to tell you what I think I would do. Uh, but yeah, there's, that, that's, just, that's just nonsense. And it's being, that's stories that are being peddled by people who are not going to vote. <laughs> One more thing, I'll be brief. It, it comes out again to civility and respect. We, were, we had the honor of being invited to the, uh, the union uh, forum where we were interviewed with uh, the other candidates for office. And uh, I won't mention any names, but one gentleman stood up towards the end of being in the back of the room and indicated that he had worked for an extended period of time for the town and it was getting more and more difficult to get up in the morning and go to work because this person hasn't been treated civilly and with respect. You can't have that. You need to have a workforce that not only is proud to work for the town, but the town is proud, proud to have them work for them as well. Having a, a, a gentleman who's worked for a long time for the town to feel that it's a burden to have to get up in the morning because that person doesn't feel respected, it, it affects not only the person, it not, affects not only the people he, he works with, it affects his family, it affects his health perhaps, and we can't have that. People need to be treated with respect. You go into work, you pay for your job, you work hard. The return for that is obviously your paycheck. You're earning your paycheck. You're not volunteering. But the responsibility of management is to treat the person, every person, under their control with respect. We've gotten away from that a bit in town. Uh, there's been numerous complaints, numerous grievances filed, and it's just not right. So we've got to be able to work in a situation where people are treated with respect, and treated civilly. And we have to insist on that too if we get elected on, on the board. Thank you. Tom and I talk too much. Why don't you hold the mic? <laughs> okay. This one, I'm not sure where you're at at time. I know people have been saying. Oh, we're, we're doing good. Okay. Um, what is your five year vision for the town? Where should the town be in five years? And what are the main steps that you would take to implement that vision? Um, that's a great question. Um, obviously, we prepare the platform with the goal of um, seeing improvements, and, and you'll see that right up top says town finances. The town finances need to get under control. We need to establish a credit rating. We need to get out of junk bond status. Um, and we listed the steps on how to do that. So in five years, we would like to have a nice credit rating. We'd like to have audited books. Um, we'd like to have internal controls. We'd like to um, have budgets that are prepared before they are due. Um, uh, town employees, of course, we'd like to see the morale improve. We'd like to see um, the, the, the town operating efficiently and effectively with contracts for the employees with, for what they deserve. Um, we'd like to have town board meetings run with um, courtesy and respect and, and collaboration again. I overuse that word, I know, but I just, I think that that's essential. So in five years, um, please take a look at the platform. That's what we hope to see. Um, we spent a lot of time putting it together um, and, um, you know, really outlining how we hope to accomplish those goals. We didn't slap this together and say, you know, oh, the finances need to get better. We really listed out the things that need to be done um, to, to accomplish that. And the other thing we want to change is the culture of government in this town. We're trying to we're trying to do a new way of politics as a prelude to a new way of government. 
Uh, if we are successful in this campaign, the political system will, will collapse. And the political system as we currently know it will collapse. Uh, some of the individuals who have been controlling things will have been discredited. They will be replaced by other people. But what we want to do is change the culture of government. Five years, for example, I'm, I'm very interested in the revitalization of Columbia Turnpike. The reason nobody does that when they become supervisor is it could take five to eight years to do that. But it takes five to eight years of work to do that. So if I can lay the groundwork in four years, and then somebody else is, is on the front page of the Times Union taking credit for that, I'll be a happy man. Because you have to lay the groundwork. Each, look, the town's a mess. The town government is a disaster. Okay, the word casino has not come up tonight, so let me bring it up. Okay? Whether you're for the casino or against it, and I was very seriously against it, here's what happened. There were four applicants in the capital region. Schenectady, Rensselaer, Howe Caverns, and us. Now, the, the law that enables those applications to be filed was called the Upstate Gaming and Development, Economic Development. The goal by our harebrained governor who thinks government should be promoting gambling, the goal was to revitalize the needy areas. Okay, so you, the Buffalo Business News does a study of affluence among 861 upstate municipalities. <coughs> Schenectady comes in 814. Okay? You been to Schenectady? Me, right? Go down to Rensselaer, where 50% of the residents in Rensselaer are on some kind of public assistance. Me. Go out to Howe Caverns. So Harry County was level in a hurricane. That's me. Do you know how they built the case on need in East Greenbush, where the unemployment uh, rate is 3%, where the median housing uh, price is higher than almost anywhere in the capital region, where the Buffalo Business News rates us in the top 5% of affluence in the upstate New York. You know what need was? Now, we have Schenectady broken, we have Rensselaer broken, we have Howe Caverns broken. The need identified in East Greenbush was the broken town government. <laughs> That's what it was. The town is broken, and the people who were for the casino, they were for the casino, and if you talk to people who were for it, some of you I'm sure, every argument they made was to fix what's wrong with the town. Lower taxes, we get money to fix the parks, we get this, that, and the other thing. My response was, do not decimate this community to solve the problems of town government. Change the government, change the people who are doing it, fix the government, save the community, and, um, and, and for those of you who, who uh, are interested, uh, save these screen bush, in fact, save these screen bush. Mm -hmm. so, there you have it. Let me just turn the five year out question around just a little bit. Um, if you think the town is working better now than it did five years ago, then you probably shouldn't vote for it. <laughs> If you think there's room for improvement over the next five years, please give us some consideration. Thank you. Um, what do you want to do with time, Jackie? I have two more questions in my hand. I'm done. You're uh, done? Yeah, one was redundant. Okay. Let's keep going. Let's keep going with the questions. Okay. Then, then we'll um, open up. <laughs> what does East Greenbush first propose to do with the town's wastewater treatment facility? There seems to be a huge expense that keeps sucking our tax dollars into an endless black hole. Should we even be in the wastewater treatment business? Well, no, we shouldn't, but we are. Okay. The reality is we are. Jim Flanagan, the former town supervisor in North Greenbush, came to an event, a residence forum that we held in April at the library and said we should sell it. Nobody's going to buy it. Nobody's going to buy it. We, we're, we're, we look into external sources of funding to to fray the cost, we look into shared services arrangements with uh, neighboring municipalities to defray the cost. Uh, we're going to have to be creative. Uh, towns this size typically do not have their own wastewater treatment plants. Look around Rensselaer County. Uh, Hoosick Falls has a, a substation because of how far away they are. We should have hooked into the county, but we couldn't have had a casino if we hooked into the county. Uh, not that I'm charging conspiracy, I, don't, I honestly don't know, it's just suspicious to me. 
we're in the wastewater treatment business now. We have to make the most of it. Because in addition to the costs I specified before, the other thing we've learned in the last six months is it's going to require additional staff. DPW is understaffed now, and we're going to have to find a way to get staff to do the wastewater treatment plant. So uh, should we see in the wastewater treatment business? No, we should. We absolutely should not. As one town council member famously said when the decision was being made, we want to control our own destiny which is the mantra of East Greenbush government, which is another way of saying don't let anybody in our business because they might see something we don't want them to see. Um, we have one last written question, and then, you know, I don't know if you want we'll to... We'll open up if anybody yeah. wants to say anything. Um, the last question that we have is um, a good one for the end of the question. With so many problems back, mm -hmm. what will you do first if you're elected? Well, I already said I'll call the state patrol. Um, I will do that. First off, when we were walking petitions, and we walked and walked, and we got signature after signature, and the one thing people said to me, why would you want to do this? And there are nights that I wake up at 3.30 in the morning, I sit up in bed, and I say, why would I want to do this? And Joanne finally realizes I'm bouncing around in bed, and she, she sits up and says, you'll be great, don't worry. <laughs> um, but I do worry about it. The first thing I would do is, even before you get elected, you have to staff the, a new government. You have to do the interviews. You have to find the right people. You have to set up for the organization. But once in office on the first day, my two goals would be call the state controller and scream help. Uh, and the second would be to bring the staff of town hall uh, and DPW together and assure them that things have changed. Uh, you walk into town hall now, you can cut the tension with a knife. Uh, you talk to people, as Tom said, you talk to people in DPW who are having serious emotional issues dealing with their job. And what's most significant about that is the people who are having emotional issues with their job are the best and the brightest in our Department of Public Works. It's not people who are slacking off and are mad that, you know, that, that they're being yelled at. These are the people who are carrying this town and they're having problems. I will call everybody together. I will let them know what I expect. I will let them know what I expect from the way they treat each other. Uh, so the first two things for me are screen help on the town finances and immediately try to, to change morale among the town workforce because uh, I, want, I want them to know that I'm on their side. I want them to know that we're in this together. And you want to know something else? I'd also want them to know that the next four years are going to be a blast <laughs> because I just will not accept unhappiness. I really <laughs> want you happy. If, you're not, if you don't whistle while you work, you're not working. <laughs> so, so to me, it, that would be critical. That would be the first thing that, that I would do. Okay. So what we'd like to do now is uh, comments. Anything you want to tell us, anything you want to say. If you have additional questions, we'll pass, pass the microphone around. Anyone want to talk? Because if you, if you don't say so, you're going to keep yeah. hearing it from me. Um, Scott, I, I think it, uh, you guys know when I first started the country. Um, one of the problems that I had was that uh, uh, with, my, with my hearing, was I couldn't hear what was going on. And uh, I spent about five months uh, kind of talking to Supervisor Langley, to the uh, town clerk. Somebody you know, I could ask a question to, like, do you have any accommodations for somebody with a hearing impairment? And all I ever got was, no. I not not one person asked me or said to me, I'm going to look into that and see what we can do. Now, just for people who haven't attended town meetings, when we started going, they didn't even have microphones. They didn't have an, uh, an audio system to amplify it. Um, finally, what happened was, um, <coughs> after asking and asking, I got some response, but then I got to a point where I thought they were just uh, blowing me off, and I finally went to the uh, Department of Human Resources and I filed a complaint, um, which uh, became New York State complaint as well as a federal uh, uh, American <coughs> State complaint. Um, my question is, uh, we need to do more because my problem has been solved, right? but there are a lot of other people, for example, senior citizens who can't attend meetings, 
uh, who can't participate. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the other things that, uh, that you guys uh, would consider doing if you're elected? Thanks, Lee. Um, we would definitely stream, the, we would do our best to stream the town board meetings online. Um, if we aren't able to do that, it's very easy to videotape uh, a meeting and upload that, and we can create a YouTube channel very, very easily. My 12-year-old has done it. Um, <laughs> don't watch his videos, they're all about baseball. Uh, but there are many solutions that, that we would undertake to accommodate people. There's no reason why people shouldn't have the information about what happens at the meeting. Um, we would take a creative approach to that, definitely. Um, it's a great question. And um, we would also make sure that the meeting minutes were posted in a timely fashion, um, and that the meeting minutes were comprehensive, so that they did cover all that was, was covered at the meeting. Anybody else? Okay, Just a I just want to thank you all for your exhibited fortitude. Um, that's the first thing I wanted to say. A question I have is, seemingly, it's extremely at this town amongst other towns in Rexham County. Well, we, we want to make a lot of effort because the revenue of the town sales tax. Uh, it's been said in the past that our share of that is not what it could be. Uh, Jim Flanagan in North Greenbush went on a campaign to increase the percentage of the county sales tax that North Greenbush got. And it took him a lot of years. It took a lot of massaging of the politics of the county legislature. But he actually did it. Um, there's an unfair distribution of county sales tax based on whether you're a town or a city. Uh, cities <coughs> having an advantage. Now, Rensselaer is a city. We're a town. Uh, that makes no sense. So we want to work with them on that. Uh, we want to work with them on any number of things. In terms of working with other municipalities, uh, shared services agreements are important. They're really important, and they're the, wa they're the wave of the future. But no supervisor in East Greenbush has ever gone to the regional economic forum. There's something called the Supervisors Club where supervisors get together and they all you know, they have a drink and they talk about the problems of town. Not once has an East Greenbush supervisor attended these things. I will be all over the place, okay? And I don't even drink. I'm not going for free drinks. Um, but I will be there because you learn from people who, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a technology transfer. You talk to people, they've had this problem. Now we're, we have this problem, what did you do about it? So we would try to work with everyone. We've worked with state legislators, uh, county legislators, and we would try, you know, we have some, like Bruin has shared services agreements with uh, other towns, and, and, it, and it's caused a little bit of friction in the way that they've done it. Um, the DPW wanted to, to have a shared services agreement with Troy. That kind of thing has to be very carefully handled, uh, especially with DPW, because we don't have enough gas. So we can't risk having half of them out in Troy uh, for their 400 water main break in a six-month period. So you have to be careful with that stuff, but you really want to, you really have to have your eyes and ears open every minute for that kind of stuff. Uh, that's the idea of getting grants. You can get grants that are available to several municipalities at the same time. If you will share services, you can get money to facilitate that. So we'd be looking at that. County legislature is hard to work with. Um, East Greenbush was historically a Democratic town. It's a Republican county legislature. And we're neither. We're, we're some kind of hybrid um, being. And, when, for example, when we did our signatures, we were worried about being challenged because there's two election commissioners in Rensselaer County. One is a Democrat, one's a Republican. So if somebody challenges a Democrat signature, well, the Democratic commissioner is there to protect them. And if somebody challenges a Republican, the Republican commissioner is there to protect them, but we knew we would have no protection, and that they, it would be a vested interest for both of them to try to 
get us off the ballot. So our solution was we needed 294 signatures, and we got 1,600. Uh, and we dared them to challenge it, and they didn't. They didn't waste their time or their money. We would have liked it if they did. But, um, and we could have gotten 2,000, but we figured we proved our point. We submitted them a week early, and, and off we go. So it's going to be hard to, un to know what the politics are. You know, if I win, will Kathy Chimino call me, the county executive, and say, you know, let's get together and talk about what we can do? Because if she does, I'm there. I, I know where Troy is. I can get there, um, and we'll talk about it. So it, it's difficult. On a positive note, between the three of us, we have over 45 years of governmental experience. We might not be part of the established political parties, but we know the language of government. We know how to go after grants. We know how to really do some research on legislation that might be a benefit to the people of East Greenwich. I'll tell you one thing we'll do, uh, and again, I think most of the people in this room would do it, even though they might not have the governmental experience. We've restored the, the, uh, the position of director of planning. That's a certainty. You've got a town here that misses out on um, grants, legislation, and, and you name it, because this administration took a look at the personnel, and they decided to eliminate the position of director of planning. That was a mistake. We'll rectify that mistake when we come in. I just want to add that if you go to any of our town board meetings, you will see that Robin Bailey, one of our county legislators, attends every meeting. And if he's there and he's aware of those meetings, we should be talking to him and he should be advocating for us. We do have lawn signs in the back if you like what you heard. Um, please grab one. Um, uh, if you're not following us on Facebook, please follow us on Facebook because we update that almost daily. And we also are on Twitter, which we have not that many followers. So let's boost that up. You had a question? Um, I, I don't know if it's a question. Maybe or not. I'd like to thank the three of you for this. I mean, if anybody. If anybody questions whether you guys are tough and, and determined and brave, just look at the ridiculously, insanely stupid job you're trying to do. <laughs> Who wants this? <laughs> um, but really what I want to, what I'd like to say, and it's not really a question, there's a saying that you can disagree without being disagreeable. And I'm saying that not for what you think I'm saying. I think the three of you have part two down very well. You're respectful. You, you can disagree. You can keep from being disagreeable. The point that I want to make to the three of you is: the platform is great. Your ideas are great. Nothing happens until you get elected. You got to get elected. And in order for that to happen, you got to do part one, which is disagree. You got to get your message out there. You have to tell people why they should vote for you and not for Dave Van Wormer and not for uh, Andrea Smith and not for Larry Lennox and there's somebody I don't know on the other one and not for the current supervisor. And you, I'm thinking that chances are the majority of people that are in this room kind of were sold before they walked through the door. You don't have to convince us. You know, you should be going to churches every Sunday. And, you know, our church, the Methodist church, has a coffee hour afterwards. And talk to them and say, hey, we'd like to talk to your congregation. Because a lot of those people, you know, they have trouble getting out the front step. But every Sunday, man, they're at church. <laughs> they're there. They're ready to listen to what you have to say. And when you say your message, you've got to disagree. I mean, when Dave Van Wormer says in a town board meeting that you shouldn't go after these payments that were made inappropriately to town employees because it would cost too much money. You gotta stand up and say, how much is too much? Is a quarter of a million dollars taken from our taxes too much? Is a half million? When do you say no? And does it really cost you that much to send a letter to somebody that works for the town? Does it cost you that much to garnish their wages? Disagree. Um. I'd like to thank you for the compliment. Thank you very much. And of course, we, we, we thank all of you for coming, um, for, for this many people to come out on a beautiful Tuesday night. I mean, that's very, very impressive. So thank you for that. 
Um, if you look at our platform, the uh, opening paragraph of each of our headers is a, is a technical disagreement and what we think is going wrong. Um, we have started going door to door. Um, I love that idea about churches, so, th so thanks for bringing that up. Um, we need your help. We need we need people to um, you know spread the word verbally. Um, we are going to do our best to knock on every door in this town between now and November 3rd, but word of mouth, my friend Diane here brought her neighbors. Um, you know, if everybody spreads the word, it will help. Um, if you share our Facebook post, if you're on Facebook, you share it, then all of your followers see it. There are many, many ways, very simple ways that you can do it from your house um, to help us spread the word because advertising is extremely expensive. Those ads in advertiser cost a fortune. Um, we will be running those, of course. Um, we will be doing town-wide mailing. Um, we do have a plan. We have a fantastic marketing person over there. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we do have a plan, and we appreciate you at bringing that up so that we can talk about it. And I also, thank you. Here, here's what we're doing, and this is why I appreciate your question, but I think we have the answer to it. Uh, we are on a different calendar. Uh, we had a billboard up in May for two weeks on Cal's Corner because we were announcing our candidacy. Nobody does that. Uh, but what we were trying to do was forge a, to do an independent nominating petition. We're on a completely different timetable. So in July, when we went out to get our signatures, that was in effect our primary. Uh, we knocked on probably 3,000 doors in this tent in the course of 30 days of doing it. Then what happens is we go into this lull because we're not in the primary. So last Thursday, when the primary happened, uh, we began our campaign on Friday. And so what we did is Saturday and Sunday we were out in the neighborhoods. Uh, tonight is a residence forum, which is unheard of. Uh, tomorrow night's a town board meeting, and then Thursday we, we go back into the neighborhoods. We're going to do this as much. Uh, we are organizing and challenging uh, our opponents to debates. Uh, there are some I could name right now who aren't going to show up, but we'll hold them without them. Uh, and disagree, yes, because because everything we're doing begins from a critique. You know, we, we, we didn't like what we saw. We don't like what we see. Now, I'm the softest spoken person that you'll hear. I never really raise my voice, and if I do, it's through passion and happiness and all that kind of stuff. So I get, I get that you have to be tougher and you have to disagree and all that, but intellectually, I'm a menace. And I argue with everyone. Um, my wife is here. She will, she will, say, she will agree with me. Uh, we're going, this is an argument. And I don't mean an argument like people losing their temper with each other. But a campaign is an argument. And, and we're ready to argue. Uh, I, everything Tina said, I echo because we need all the help we can get. The way this political system is set up, one of two things is going to happen in this election. We're either going to catch fire become a phenomenon and sweep this election or we're going to lose. Because the absentee ballots, all of the signed over ballots, these guys have this election wrapped up eight ways from Sunday. But we're not going to take it. And the way we're not going to take it is we are going to impress upon the people of East Greenbush that democracy is not something that's thriving in their town. And we have a chance. And I promise you this will be the only chance the people of East Greenbush will ever have to wipe the slate clean. And the reason we can do it is because we believe we're in a perfect storm. The casino woke this town up. Whether you were for it or against it, you saw how our town board works. We have the documents. Five days after Keith Langley knew there could be a casino, he was in a back room with Saratoga Casino and Raceway planning a strategy to bypass the people of East Greenbush. So they could get that thing approved before we knew what hit us. Okay, um, we're not going to have that. But what happened there is people woke up. You can't unring that bell. People in this town for the first time know what their government is and how it's been operating. Secondly, the parties are falling all over themselves. The Republicans are fighting with each other. The Democrats don't like each other. Uh, they're not in optimal position to win an election. And then third, and I say this immodestly, but I say it from the bottom of my heart, we have the best candidates. And, and it's not even close. <laughs> so if you put the 
together in that perfect storm of people are awake, the parties are fracturing, and we have the best candidates, for the first time and possibly the only time, we have a chance to wipe the slate clean in this town and start over with people who are different, with ideas that are different, uh, with techniques that are different. And if we don't succeed this time, people are going to see how hard we work, uh, how much money we put into it, how many incredible volunteers we had helping us. And if they see that we fail, this is not going to be attempted again. Uh, it's, it's really never been attempted this way before. And I'll go a step further. There's only one example in the capital region of anyone ever winning an election from the bottom of the ballot on a single line. People have done this kind of ballot line and Fuse got another party line or two other party lines at once. This has never been done. In a, it, it, it was a, a highway superintendent race that somebody won doing this with 240 votes. This has never been done, but I will tell you here right now, the election is 49 days from today. It's seven weeks from now to there, and I make you this promise, we're going to win. of a bad bond rating is you get the highest interest rate uh, and you pay the most. Where the, where the bond rating has hurt us is in perception. And in 
for example, businesses who might think to move here start to see things like this. Because Moody's is, is expert at looking at these kinds of situations. And what we feel they've done with, the, with junk bond status is they sounded an alarm. And then uh, Stephen Moore picks it up. He used to write for the Wall Street Journal. And he puts out the list of the 20 municipalities in the country most likely to go bankrupt. And we are on it. I mean, Detroit was on it. Uh, Providence, Rhode Island was on it. And there was East Greenbush. And so it draws this negative attention to the town. Uh, perception is everything. Like those of us who live in have a Rensselaer 12144 address, I always used to laugh that we have the worst of both possible worlds. We have East Greenbush taxes and the perception that we live in Rensselaer. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that, that actually hurts people. Like when you, it's not, I mean, it's not a major effect, but when people try to sell their homes. Uh, so there's a perception. So much of revitalizing this community is based on this subjective thing. You know, something happens in the air. It happened in Clifton Park about 20 or 25 years ago. This was the happening place. This was the place you wanted to be. If you had a restaurant, if you were going to do a, a high-end housing development, Clifton Park's the place you want to be. Uh, East Greenwich now has the opposite <coughs> perception, which is it, it was a once great town that is slipping. And what, so the worst effect of junk bond status to this point has been perception. It's been people saying, that town's turning into a dump. For me, the worst part of junk bond status is to watch the town government six years later not even, not even utter the words junk bond status. And there's a person who's no longer on the town council who once tried to make for me a convoluted argument that junk bond status was in our best interest. <laughs> and what, I won't use the gender because that might give it away, but what this person said to me was, well, in effect, we've got this $2 million debt and this free money because it's not hurting us. Uh, and we were able to spend this as free money. And what happened, the way we got into that was through interfund borrowing. Money was being taken out of the water and sewer funds and being applied to deficits in the highway and general fund. Now that's legal, but it must, those funds must be paid back by the end of that year. Well, it's six years later and we're still waiting. Now we have a supervisor, here goes the disagreement. Uh, now we have a supervisor who is lying about our town finances. And what, the way he's doing it is amazing. I give him points, I give him and his people points for clever deceit. They're taking money from GEIS fees and amenity fees, which are dedicated to certain things and can't be used that way, they're paper applying them to the highway and general funds and claiming a half million dollar reduction in the debt. The clever and bitter irony of that is they're trying to hide interfund borrowing with another kind of interfund borrowing. And, and so this, 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 is, this is kind of the hall of mirrors we're in. And so John Fon said, I, I wish I could answer your question more precisely, but the real problem is that 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 issue works. If we have some kind of, I mean, we have an old town, we have an old infrastructure. If we hit some kind of massive disaster in our infrastructure, and we have to go fast out onto the market to borrow the money, we're going to be paying through the nose, and we're going to be paying for a long time. And then 30, 40, 60 percent of you will have the for sale sign, because the future just, just will be untethered. Okay, I wish I could do that. I just want to say that um, after going around this weekend uh, to hand out uh, flyers and stuff like that to talk about this meeting, uh, I realized how long it takes to go door to door. And so I really appreciate the work that the three of you did and everybody else who helped to try to get the word out there. Um, I, I found it was very useful when people were out walking their dogs I could go up to them and tell them about this meeting and we could discuss as neighbors of East Greenbush what we were dissatisfied with. Uh, a lot of people were not home uh, when we went out but I think it's really important for everybody who's here to get the word out to whoever you know who lives in East Greenbush that there is uh, new possibilities. I've lived in the town for probably 35 or 40 years, and this is the first time I really feel any hope. 
Jeanette, I first want to thank you for putting the flyer at my house. <laughs> <laughs> we did that intentionally. <laughs> I loved it. I wanted you to know we came out there. <laughs> um, we do need your help. Um, you know, as the election gets closer, we will be doing other than mailing flyers. And if anybody wants to help, just put out 10 flyers in your own neighborhood. Um, send us an email. Come and stop by and, uh, and sign up on the list. But, um, uh, you know, please do that. First of all, I want to thank you because what I expressed in an email, Facebook, and text message to everybody in my address book yesterday. I lost hope. I lost hope. I stopped, I stopped voting. I got sick of people coming to my door every year promising what they were going to do. Now, I grew up here. I saw this town grow steadily, and now I've watched it go down the downside. I know nothing about politics. Or I don't really get involved in politics. She knows that, because I tell her that all the time. I know that's what you're good at. I'm not good at that. But what I do know is every time I come and I hear you speak, I mean, I'm irritated about what's been going on here. But I'm concerned that, I mean, I talk to people, and you're right, they're weak. They're weak. They're concerned. But, you know, I wonder, are they really going to go to the polls? Are they really going to go and vote? Because I truly believe that if everybody heard you all speak, heard the way you're answering your questions, I think that would drive everyone to the polls. No matter what they want to do, how they want to vote, I think that would drive people to finally understand these things. They have to go vote. I mean, it's, it's, it's gone too far. You're absolutely right. Every vote counts as a one vote. Uh, before we before we wrap this up, uh, Tina, Tom, and I have uh, just a couple of uh, debts of gratitude. And the way I'm going to do it is I just want to say the names of some people who have been working tirelessly and brilliantly on our behalf. So I just want to say the names Joanne Rector, Bonnie uh, Tanner, Laura Ryan. Joanne Conway, Eileen <laughs> Brandt, and Jonathan Shapiro. Uh, what, I, what I'd really like to is, you know, we, we offered this in, in, in tonight as something new. Uh, we really appreciate that you took it in the spirit. We offered it. Uh, we're, we're humbled by the, the thanks and, and the kind words that you've all given us. Thank you so much for coming, and in the next 49 days, we promise you we will do every single thing we can to wake people up, to, to uh, talk about what we want to do, and most importantly, get them to the polls. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you.